英語聞き流しリスニング英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロードその他の物語はホームページからお聞きいただけます 88thpp.com 88thpp.com Chapter 5 In which the narrative of our night's mishap is continued Finding, then, that, in fact he could not move, he thought himself of having recourse to his usual remedy, which was to think of some passage in his books, and his craze brought to his mind that about Baldwin and the Marquis of Mantua, when Carlotto left him wounded on the mountainside, a story known by heart by the children, not forgotten by the young men, and lauded and even believed by the old folk, and for all that not a whit truer than the miracles of Muhammad. This seemed to him to fit exactly the case in which he found himself, so, making a show of severe suffering, he began to roll on the ground and with feeble breath repeat the very words which the wounded knight of the wood is said to have uttered. Where art thou, lady mine, that thou my sorrow dost not rue? Thou canst not know it, lady mine, or else thou art untrue. And so he went on with the ballad as far as the lines. O noble Marquis of Mantua, my uncle and liege lord! As chance would have it, when he had got to this line there happened to come by a peasant from his own village, a neighbour of his, who had been with a load of wheat to the mill, and he, seeing the man stretched there, came up to him and asked him who he was and what was the matter with him that he complained so dolefully. Don Quixote was firmly persuaded that this was the Marquis of Mantua, his uncle, so the only answer he made was to go on with his ballad, in which he told the tale of his misfortune, and of the loves of the emperor's son and his wife all exactly as the ballad sings it. The peasant stood amazed at hearing such nonsense, and relieving him of the visor, already battered to pieces by blows, he wiped his face, which was covered with dust, and as soon as he had done so he recognized him and said, Senor Quixada, for so he appears to have been called when he was in his senses and had not yet changed from a quiet country gentleman into a knight errant, who has brought your worship to this pass? But to all questions the other only went on with his ballad. Seeing this, the good man removed as well as he could his breastplate and back piece to see if he had any wound, but he could perceive no blood nor any mark whatever. He then contrived to raise him from the ground, and with no little difficulty hoisted him upon his ass, which seemed to him to be the easiest mount for him, and collecting the arms, even to the splinters of the lance, he tied them on Rocinante, and leading him by the bridle and the ass by the halter he took the road for the village, very sad to hear what absurd stuff Don Quixote was talking. Nor was Don Quixote less so, for what with blows and bruises he could not sit upright on the ass, and from time to time he sent up sighs to heaven, so that once more he drove the peasant to ask what ailed him and it could have been only the devil himself that put into his head tales to match his own adventures, for now, forgetting Baldwin, he bethought himself of the Moor Abindarias, when the Alcaide of Andacara, Rodrigo de Narvaez, took him prisoner and carried him away to his castle, so that when the peasant again asked him how he was and what ailed him, he gave him for reply the same words and phrases that the captive Abindarias gave to Rodrigo de Narvaez, just as he had read the story in the Diana of Jorge de Montemayor where it is written, applying it to his own case so aptly that the peasant went along cursing his fate that he had to listen to such a lot of nonsense, from which, however, he came to the conclusion that his neighbour was mad, and so made all haste to reach the village to escape the wearisomeness of this harangue of Don Quixote's, who, with the end of it, said, Senor Don Rodrigo de Narvaez, your worship must know that this fair Zarifa I have mentioned is now the lovely Dulcinea del Toboso, for whom I have done, am doing, and will do the most famous deeds of chivalry that in this world have been seen, are to be seen, or ever shall be seen. To this the peasant answered, Senor, sinner that I am. Cannot your worship see that I am not Don Rodrigo de Narvaez nor the Marquis of Mantua, but Pedro Alonso your neighbour, and that your worship is neither Baldwin nor Abindarias, but the worthy gentleman Senor Quixada? I know who I am, replied Don Quixote, and I know that I may be not only those I have named, but all the twelve peers of France and even all the nine worthies since my achievements surpass all that they have done altogether and each of them on his own account. With this talk and more of the same kind they reached the village just as night was beginning to fall, but the peasant waited until it was a little later that the belaboured gentleman might not be seen riding in such a miserable trim. When it was what seemed to him the proper time he entered the village and went to Don Quixote's house, which he found all in confusion, and there were the curate and the village barber, who were great friends of Don Quixote, and his housekeeper was saying to them in a loud voice, what does your worship think can have befallen my master, Senor Licentiate Pero Perez? For so the curate was called, it is three days now since anything has been seen of him, or the hack, or the buckler, lance, or armor. Miserable me! I am certain of it, and it is as true as that I was born to die, 
that these accursed books of chivalry he has, and has got into the way of reading so constantly, have upset his reason, for now I remember having often heard him saying to himself that he would turn knight errant and go all over the world in quest of adventures. To the devil and Barabbas with such books, that have brought to ruin in this way the finest understanding there was in all La Mancha. The niece said the same, and, more, you must know, Master Nicholas for that was the name of the barber, it was often my uncle's way to stay two days and nights together poring over these unholy books of misventures, after which he would fling the book away and snatch up his sword and fall to slashing the walls, and when he was tired out he would say he had killed four giants like four towers, and the sweat that flowed from him when he was weary he said was the blood of the wounds he had received in battle, and then he would drink a great jug of cold water and become calm and quiet, saying that this water was a most precious potion which the sage Esquife, a great magician and friend of his, had brought him. But I take all the blame upon myself for never having told your worships of my uncle's vagaries, that you might put a stop to them before things had come to this pass, and burn all these accursed books, for he has a great number, that richly deserve to be burned like heretics. So say I too, said the curate, and by my faith tomorrow shall not pass without public judgment upon them, and may they be condemned to the flames lest they lead those that read to behave as my good friend seems to have behaved. All this the peasant heard, and from it he understood at last what was the matter with his neighbour, so he began calling aloud, Open, your worships, to Señor Baldwin and to Señor the Marquis of Mantua, who comes badly wounded, and to Señor Abindarayas, the Moor, whom the valiant Rodrigo de Narvaez, the Alcaide of Andacara, brings captive. At these words they all hurried out, and when they recognized their friend, master and uncle, who had not yet dismounted from the ass because he could not, they ran to embrace him. Hold, said he, for I am badly wounded through my horse's fault, carry me to bed, and if possible send for the wiser Ganda to cure and see to my wounds. See there. Plague on it, cried the housekeeper at this, did not my heart tell the truth as to which foot my master went lame of. To bed with your worship at once, and we will contrive to cure you here without fetching that hergata. A curse I say once more, and a hundred times more, on those books of chivalry that have brought your worship to such a pass. They carried him to bed at once, and after searching for his wounds could find none, but he said they were all bruises from having had a severe fall with his horse Rocinante when in combat with ten giants, the biggest and the boldest to be found on earth. So, so, said the curate, are there giants in the dance? By the sign of the cross I will burn them tomorrow before the day is over. They put a host of questions to Don Quixote, but his only answer to all was, give him something to eat, and leave him to sleep, for that was what he needed most. They did so, and the curate questioned the peasant at great length as to how he had found Don Quixote. He told him, and the nonsense he had talked when found and on the way home, all which made the licentiate the more eager to do what he did the next day, which was to summon his friend the barber, Master Nicholas, and go with him to Don Quixote's house. Chapter 6 Of the diverting and important scrutiny which the curate and the barber made in the library of our ingenious gentleman. He was still sleeping, so the curate asked the niece for the keys of the room where the books, the authors of all the mischief, were, and right willingly she gave them. They all went in, the housekeeper with them, and found more than a hundred volumes of big books very well bound, and some other small ones. The moment the housekeeper saw them she turned about and ran out of the room, and came back immediately with a saucer of holy water and a sprinkler, saying, Here, your worship, Señor Licentiate, sprinkle this room, don't leave any magician of the many there are in these books to bewitch us in revenge for our design of banishing them from the world. The simplicity of the housekeeper made the licentiate laugh, and he directed the barber to give him the books one by one to see what they were about, as there might be some to be found among them that did not deserve the penalty of fire. No, said the niece, there is no reason for showing mercy to any of them, they have every one of them done mischief, better fling them out of the window into the court and make a pile of them and set fire to them, or else carry them into the yard, and there a bonfire can be made without the smoke giving any annoyance. The housekeeper said the same, so eager were they both for the slaughter of those innocents, but the curate would not agree to it without first reading at any rate the titles. The first that Master Nicholas put into his hand was the four books of Amadis of Gaul. This seems a mysterious thing, said the curate, for, as I have heard say, this was the first book of chivalry printed in Spain, and from this all the others derive their birth and origin, so it seems to me that we ought inexorably to condemn it to the flames as the founder of so vile a sect. Nay, Sir, said the barber, I too, have heard say that this is the best of all the books of this kind that have been written, and so, as something singular in its line, it ought to be pardoned. True, said the curate, and for that reason let its life be spared for the present. Let us see that other which is next to it. It is, said the barber, the Sergis de Esplendian, the lawful son of Amadis of Gaul. 
Then verily, said the curate, the merit of the father must not be put down to the account of the son. Take it, mistress housekeeper, open the window and fling it into the yard and lay the foundation of the pile for the bonfire we are to make. The housekeeper obeyed with great satisfaction, and the worthy Esplandian went flying into the yard to await with all patience the fire that was in store for him. Proceed, said the curate. This that comes next, said the barber, is Amadis of Greece, and, indeed, I believe all those on this side are of the same Amadis lineage. Then to the yard with the whole of them, said the curate, for to have the burning of Queen Pindaquiniestra, and the shepherd Darinel and his eclogues, and the bedeviled and involved discourses of his author, I would burn with them the father who begot me if he were going about in the guise of a knight errant. I am of the same mind, said the barber. And so am I, added the niece. In that case, said the housekeeper, here, into the yard with them. They were handed to her, and as there were many of them, she spared herself the staircase, and flung them down out of the window. Who is that tub there? said the curate. This, said the barber, is Don Olivant de Laura. The author of that book, said the curate, was the same that wrote The Garden of Flowers, and truly there is no deciding which of the two books is the more truthful, or, to put it better, the less lying. All I can say is, send this one into the yard for a swaggering fool. This that follows is Florismarde of Hyrcania, said the barber. Senor Florismarde here, said the curate, then by my faith he must take up his quarters in the yard, in spite of his marvellous birth and visionary adventures, for the stiffness and dryness of his style deserve nothing else, into the yard with him and the other, mistress housekeeper. With all my heart, senor, said she, and executed the order with great delight. This, said the barber, is the knight platire. An old book that, said the curate, but I find no reason for clemency in it, send it after the others without appeal, which was done. Another book was opened, and they saw it was entitled, The Knight of the Cross. For the sake of the holy name this book has, said the curate, its ignorance might be excused, but then, they say, behind the cross there's the devil, to the fire with it. Taking down another book, the barber said, this is the mirror of chivalry. I know his worship, said the curate, that is where Senor Rionaldo's of Montalvan figures with his friends and comrades, greater thieves than Caucus, and the twelve peers of France with the voracious historian Turpin. However, I am not for condemning them to more than perpetual banishment, because, at any rate, they have some share in the invention of the famous Matteo Boyardo, whence to the Christian poet Ludovico Ariosto wove his web, to whom, if I find him here, and speaking any language but his own, I shall show no respect whatever, but if he speaks his own tongue I will put him upon my head. Well, I have him in Italian, said the barber, but I do not understand him. Nor would it be well that you should understand him, said the curate, and on that score we might have excused the captain if he had not brought him into Spain and turned him into Castilian. He robbed him of a great deal of his natural force, and so do all those who try to turn books written in verse into another language, for, with all the pains they take and all the cleverness they show, they never can reach the level of the originals as they were first produced. In short, I say that this book, and all that may be found treating of those French affairs, should be thrown into or deposited in some dry well, until after more consideration it is settled what is to be done with them, excepting always one Bernardo del Carpio that is going about, and another called Ronthes by us, for these, if they come into my hands, shall pass at once into those of the housekeeper, and from hers into the fire without any reprieve. To all this the barber gave his assent, and looked upon it as right and proper, being persuaded that the curate was so staunch to the faith and loyal to the truth that he would not for the world say anything opposed to them. Opening another book he saw it was Palmerin de Oliva, and beside it was another called Palmerin of England, seeing which the licentiate said, let the olive be made firewood of it once and burned until no ashes even are left, and let that palm of England be kept and preserved as a thing that stands alone, and let such another case be made for it as that which Alexander found among the spoils of Darius and set aside for the safe keeping of the works of the poet Homer. This book, Gossip, is of authority for two reasons, first because it is very good, and secondly because it is said to have been written by a wise and witty king of Portugal. All the adventures of the castle of Muragarda are excellent and of admirable contrivance, and the language is polished and clear, studying and observing the style befitting the speaker with propriety and judgment. So then, provided it seems good to you, Master Nicholas, I say let this and Amadis of Gaul be remitted the penalty of fire, and as for all the rest, let them perish without further question or query. Nay, gossip, said the barber, for this that I have here is the famous Don Belianis. Well, said the curate, that in the second, third, and fourth parts all stand in need of a little rhubarb to purge their excessive bile, and they must be cleared of all that stuff about the castle of fame and other greater affectations, 
to which end let them be allowed the overseas term, and, according as they men, so shall mercy or justice be meted out to them. And in the meantime, gossip, do you keep them in your house and let no one read them? With all my heart, said the barber, and not caring to tire himself with reading more books of chivalry, he told the housekeeper to take all the big ones and throw them into the yard. It was not said to one dull or deaf, but to one who enjoyed burning them more than weaving the broadest and finest web it could be, and seizing about eight at a time, she flung them out of the window. In carrying so many together she let one fall at the feet of the barber, who took it up, curious to know whose it was, and found it said, History of the Famous Knight, Tarante el Blanco. God bless me, said the curate with a shout, Tarante el Blanco here. Hand it over, gossip, for in it I reckon I have found a treasury of enjoyment in a mine of recreation. Here is Don Kirillison of Mondelvan, a valiant knight, and his brother Thomas of Mondelvan, and the knight Fonseca, with the battle the bold Tarante fought with the Mastiff, and the witticisms of the damsel placer de Mibita, and the loves and wiles of the widow Reposada, and the empress in love with the squire Ippolito, in truth, gossip, by right of its style it is the best book in the world. Here knights eat and sleep, and die in their beds, and make their wills before dying, and a great deal more of which there is nothing in all the other books. Nevertheless, I say he who wrote it, for deliberately composing such fooleries, deserves to be sent to the galleys for life. Take it home with you and read it, and you will see that what I have said is true. As you will, said the barber, but what are we to do with these little books that are left? These must be, not chivalry, but poetry, said the curate, and opening one he saw it was the Diana of Jorge de Montemayor, and, supposing all the others to be of the same sort, these, he said, do not deserve to be burned like the others, for they neither do nor can do the mischief the books of chivalry have done, being books of entertainment that can hurt no one. Ah, senor, said the niece, your worship had better order these to be burned as well as the others, for it would be no wonder if, after being cured of his chivalry disorder, my uncle, by reading these, took a fancy to turn shepherd and range the woods and fields singing and piping, or, what would be still worse, to turn poet, which they say is an incurable and infectious malady. The damsel is right, said the curate, and it will be well to put this stumbling block and temptation out of our friend's way. To begin, then, with the Diana of Montemayor. I am of opinion it should not be burned, but that it should be cleared of all that about the sage Felicia and the magic water, and of almost all the longer pieces of verse, let it keep, and welcome, its prose and the honour of being the first of books of the kind. This that comes next, said the barber, is the Diana, entitled the second part, by the Salamancan, and this other has the same title, and its author is Gil Polo. As for that of the Salamancan, replied the curate, let it go to swell the number of the condemned in the yard, and let Gil Polo's be preserved as if it came from Apollo himself, but get on, gossip, and make haste, for it is growing late. This book, said the barber, opening another, is the Ten Books of the Fortune of Love, written by Antonio de Lofraso, a Sardinian poet. By the orders I have received, said the curate, since Apollo has been Apollo, and the muses have been muses, and poets have been poets, so droll and absurd a book as this has never been written, and in its way it is the best and the most singular of all of this species that have as yet appeared, and he who has not read it may be sure he has never read what is delightful. Give it here, gossip, for I make more account of having found it than if they had given me a cassock of Florence stuff. He put it aside with extreme satisfaction, and the barber went on, these that come next are the shepherd of Iberia, nymphs of Inaris, and the enlightenment of jealousy. Then all we have to do, said the curate, is to hand them over to the secular arm of the housekeeper, and ask me not why, or we shall never have done. This next is the pastor de Philida. No pastor that, said the curate, but a highly polished courtier, let it be preserved as a precious jewel. This large one here, said the barber, is called the treasury of various poems. If there were not so many of them, said the curate, they would be more relished, this book must be weeded and cleansed of certain vulgarities which it has with its excellences, let it be preserved because the author is a friend of mine, and out of respect for other more heroic and loftier works that he has written. This, continued the barber, is the cancionero of Lopez de Maldonado. The author of that book, too, said the curate, is a great friend of mine, and his verses from his own mouth are the admiration of all who hear them, for such is the sweetness of his voice that he enchants when he chants them, it gives rather too much of its eclogues, but what is good was never yet plentiful, let it be kept with those that have been set apart. But what book is that next it? The Galatea of Miguel de Cervantes, said the barber. That Cervantes has been for many years a great friend of mine, and to my knowledge he has had more experience in reverses than in verses. 
His book has some good invention in it, it presents us with something but brings nothing to a conclusion, we must wait for the second part it promises, perhaps with amendment it may succeed in winning the full measure of grace that is now denied it, and in the meantime do you, Senor Gossip, keep it shut up in your own quarters. Very good, said the barber, and here come three together, the Orocana of Don Alonso de Arthea, the Austriata of Juan Rufo, Justice of Cordova, and the Montserrat of Cristobal de Virues, the Valencian poet. These three books, said the curate, are the best that have been written in Castilian and heroic verse, and they may compare with the most famous of Italy, let them be preserved as the richest treasures of poetry that Spain possesses. The curate was tired and would not look into any more books, and so he decided that, contents uncertified, all the rest should be burned, but just then the barber held open one, called the Tears of Angelica. I should have shed tears myself, said the curate when he heard the title, had I ordered that book to be burned, for its author was one of the famous poets of the world, not to say of Spain, and was very happy in the translation of some of Ovid's fables. Chapter 7 Of the Second Sally of Our Worthy Knight Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha At this instant Don Quixote began shouting out, Here, here, valiant knights! Here is need for you to put forth the might of your strong arms, for they of the court are gaining the mastery in the tourney. Called away by this noise and outcry, they proceeded no farther with the scrutiny of the remaining books, and so it is thought that the Caroli, the Lion of Spain, and the Deeds of the Emperor, written by Don Luis de Avila, went to the fire unseen and unheard, for no doubt they were among those that remained, and perhaps if the curate had seen them they would not have undergone so severe a sentence. When they reached Don Quixote he was already out of bed, and was still shouting and raving, and slashing and cutting all round, as wide awake as if he had never slept. They closed with him and by force got him back to bed, and when he had become a little calm, addressing the curate, he said to him, of a truth, Senor Archbishop Turpin, it is a great disgrace for us who call ourselves the Twelve Peers, so carelessly to allow the knights of the court to gain the victory in this tourney, with the adventurers having carried off the honour on the three former days. Hush, gossip, said the curate, please God, the luck may turn, and what is lost today may be won tomorrow, for the present let your worship have a care of your health, for it seems to me that you are over-fatigued, if not badly wounded. Wounded no, said Don Quixote, but bruised and battered no doubt, for that bastard Don Roland has cudgelled me with the trunk of an oak tree, and all for envy, because he sees that I alone rival him in his achievements. But I should not call myself Reinaldos of Mondelvon did he not pay me for it in spite of all his enchantments as soon as I rise from this bed. For the present let them bring me something to eat, for that, I feel, is what will be more to my purpose, and leave it to me to avenge myself. They did as he wished, they gave him something to eat, and once more he fell asleep, leaving them marvelling at his madness. That night the housekeeper burned to ashes all the books that were in the yard and in the whole house, and some must have been consumed that deserved preservation in everlasting archives, but their fate and the laziness of the examiner did not permit it, and so in them was verified the proverb that the innocent suffer for the guilty. One of the remedies which the curate and then the barber immediately applied to their friend's disorder was to wall up and plaster the room where the books were, so that when he got up he should not find them, possibly the cause being removed the effect might cease, and they might say that a magician had carried them off, room and all, and this was done with all dispatch. Two days later Don Quixote got up, and the first thing he did was to go and look at his books, and not finding the room where he had left it, he wandered from side to side looking for it. He came to the place where the door used to be, and tried it with his hands, and turned and twisted his eyes in every direction without saying a word, but after a good while he asked his housekeeper whereabouts was the room that held his books. The housekeeper, who had been already well instructed in what she was to answer, said, what room or what nothing is it that your worship is looking for? There are neither room nor books in this house now, for the devil himself has carried all away. It was not the devil, said the niece, but a magician who came on a cloud one night after the day your worship left this, and dismounting from a serpent that he rode he entered the room, and what he did there I know not, but after a little while he made off, flying through the roof, and left the house full of smoke and when we went to see what he had done we saw neither book nor room, but we remember very well, the housekeeper and I, that on leaving, the old villain said in a loud voice that, for a private grudge he owed the owner of the books and the room, he had done mischief in the house that would be discovered by and by, he said too that his name was the sage Minotin. He must have said Friston, said Don Quixote. I don't know whether he called himself Friston or Fritton, said the housekeeper, I only know that his name ended with Tun. So it does, said Don Quixote and he is a sage magician, a great enemy of mine, who has a spite against me because he knows by his arts and lore that in process of time I am to engage in single combat with a knight whom he befriends and that I am to conquer, and he will be unable to prevent it, 
and for this reason he endeavors to do me all the ill turns that he can, but I promise him it will be hard for him to oppose or avoid what is decreed by heaven. Who doubts that? said the niece, but, uncle, who mixes you up in these quarrels? Would it not be better to remain at peace in your own house instead of roaming the world looking for better bread than ever came of wheat, never reflecting that many go for wool and come back shorn? Oh, niece of mine, replied Don Quixote, how much astray art thou in thy reckoning, ere they shear me I shall have plucked away and stripped off the beards of all who dare to touch only the tip of a hair of mine. The two were unwilling to make any further answer, as they saw that his anger was kindling. In short, then, he remained at home fifteen days very quietly without showing any signs of a desire to take up with his former delusions, and during this time he held lively discussions with his two gossips, the curate and the barber, on the point he maintained, that knights errant were what the world stood most in need of, and that in him was to be accomplished the revival of knight errantry. The curate sometimes contradicted him, sometimes agreed with him, for if he had not observed this precaution he would have been unable to bring him to reason. Meanwhile Don Quixote worked upon a farm labourer, a neighbour of his, an honest man, if indeed that title can be given to him who is poor, but with very little wit in his pate. In a word, he so talked him over, and with such persuasions and promises, that the poor clown made up his mind to sally forth with him and serve him as esquire. Don Quixote, among other things, told him he ought to be ready to go with him gladly, because any moment an adventure might occur that might win an island in the twinkling of an eye and leave him governor of it. On these and the like promises Sancho Panza, for so the labourer was called, left wife and children, and engaged himself as esquire to his neighbour. Don Quixote next set about getting some money, and selling one thing and pawning another, and making a bad bargain in every case, he got together a fair sum. He provided himself with a buckler, which he begged as a loan from a friend, and, restoring his battered helmet as best he could, he warned his squire Sancho of the day and hour he meant to set out, that he might provide himself with what he thought most needful. Above all, he charged him to take Alforges with him. The other said he would, and that he meant to take also a very good ass he had, as he was not much given to going on foot. About the ass, Don Quixote hesitated a little, trying whether he could call to mind any knight errant taking with him an esquire mounted on ass back, but no instance occurred to his memory. For all that, however, he determined to take him, intending to furnish him with a more honourable mount when a chance of it presented itself, by appropriating the horse of the first discourteous knight he encountered. Himself he provided with shirts and such other things as he could, according to the advice the host had given him, all which being done, without taking leave, Sancho Ponsa of his wife and children, or Don Quixote of his housekeeper and niece, they sallied forth unseen by anybody from the village one night, and made such good way in the course of it that by daylight they held themselves safe from discovery, even should search be made for them. Sancho rode on his ass like a patriarch, with his alforges and boda, and longing to see himself soon governor of the island his master had promised him. Don Quixote decided upon taking the same route and road he had taken on his first journey, that over the Campo de Montiel, which he travelled with less discomfort than on the last occasion, for, as it was early morning and the rays of the sun fell on them obliquely, the heat did not distress them. And now said Sancho Panza to his master, Your worship will take care, Senor Knight Errant, not to forget about the island you have promised me, for be it ever so big I'll be equal to governing it. To which Don Quixote replied, Thou must know, friend Sancho Panza, that it was a practice very much in vogue with the knights errant of old to make their squires governors of the islands or kingdoms they won, and I am determined that there shall be no failure on my part in so liberal a custom. On the contrary, I mean to improve upon it, for they sometimes, and perhaps most frequently, waited until their squires were old, and then when they had had enough of service and hard days and worse nights, they gave them some title or other, of count, or at the most marquis, of some valley or province more or less, but if thou livest and I live, it may well be that before six days are over, I may have won some kingdom that has others dependent upon it, which will be just the thing to enable thee to be crowned king of one of them. Nor needst thou count this wonderful, for things and chances fall to the lot of such knights in ways so unexampled and unexpected that I might easily give thee even more than I promise thee. In that case, said Sancho Panza, if I should become a king by one of those miracles your worship speaks of, even Juana Gutierrez, my old woman, would come to be queen and my children in fondness. Well, who doubts it? said Don Quixote. I doubt it, replied Sancho Panza, because for my part I am persuaded that though God should shower down kingdoms upon earth, not one of them would fit the head of Mari Gutierrez. Let me tell you, senor, she is not worth two Maravetis for a queen, Countess will fit her better, and that only with God's help. Leave it to God, Sancho, returned Don Quixote, for he will give her what suits her best, 
but do not undervalue thyself so much as to come to be content with anything less than being governor of a province. I will not, Senor, answered Sancho, specially as I have a man of such quality for a master in your worship, who will know how to give me all that will be suitable for me and that I can bear. Chapter 8 Of the good fortune which the valiant Don Quixote had in the terrible and undreamt of adventure of the windmills, with other occurrences worthy to be fitly recorded. At this point they came in sight of thirty-forty windmills that there are on plain, and as soon as Don Quixote saw them he said to his squire, Fortune is arranging matters for us better than we could have shaped our desires ourselves, for look there, friend Sancho Panza, where thirty or more monstrous giants present themselves, all of whom I mean to engage in battle and slay, and with whose spoils we shall begin to make our fortunes, for this is righteous warfare, and it is God's good service to sweep so evil a breed from off the face of the earth. What giants? said Sancho Panza. Those thou seest there, answered his master, with the long arms, and some have them nearly two leagues long. Look, your worship, said Sancho, what we see there are not giants but windmills, and what seem to be their arms are the sails that turned by the wind make the millstone go. It is easy to see, replied Don Quixote, that thou art not used to this business of adventures, those are giants, and if thou art afraid, away with thee out of this and betake thyself to prayer while I engage them in fierce and unequal combat. So saying, he gave the spur to his steed Rocinante, heedless of the cries his squire Sancho sent after him, warning him that most certainly they were windmills and not giants he was going to attack. He, however, was so positive they were giants that he neither heard the cries of Sancho, nor perceived, near as he was, what they were, but made at them shouting, Fly not, cowards and vile beings, for a single night attacks you. A slight breeze at this moment sprang up, and the great sails began to move, seeing which Don Quixote exclaimed, Though ye flourish more arms than the giant Briarius, ye have to reckon with me. So saying, and commending himself with all his heart to his lady Dulcinea, imploring her to support him in such a peril, with lance in rest and covered by his buckler, he charged at Rocinante's fullest gallop and fell upon the first mill that stood in front of him, but as he drove his lance point into the sail the wind whirled it round with such force that it shivered the lance to pieces, sweeping with it horse and rider, who went rolling over on the plain, in a sorry condition. Sancho hastened to his assistance as fast as his ass could go, and when he came up found him unable to move, with such a shock had Rocinante fallen with him. God bless me, said Sancho, did I not tell your worship to mind what you were about, for they were only windmills? And no one could have made any mistake about it but one who had something of the same kind in his head. Hush, friend Sancho, replied Don Quixote, the fortunes of war more than any other are liable to frequent fluctuations, and moreover I think, and it is the truth, that that same sage Friston who carried off my study and books, has turned these giants into mills in order to rob me of the glory of vanquishing them, such is the enmity he bears me, but in the end his wicked arts will avail but little against my good sword. God order it as he may, said Sancho Panza, and helping him to rise got him up again on Rocinante, whose shoulder was half out, and then, discussing the late adventure, they followed the road to Puerto Lapis, for there, said Don Quixote, they could not fail to find adventures in abundance and variety, as it was a great thoroughfare. For all that, he was much grieved at the loss of his lance, and saying so to his squire, he added, I remember having read how a Spanish knight, Diego Perez de Vargas by name, having broken his sword in battle, tore from an oak a ponderous bough or branch, and with it did such things that day, and pounded so many moors, that he got the surname of Machuca, and he and his descendants from that day forth were called Vargas y Machuca. I mention this because from the first oak I see I mean to rend such another branch, large and stout like that, with which I am determined and resolved to do such deeds that thou mayest deem thyself very fortunate in being found worthy to come and see them, and be an eyewitness of things that will with difficulty be believed. Be that as God will, said Sancho, I believe it all as your worship says it, but straighten yourself a little, for you seem all on one side, maybe from the shaking of the fall. That is the truth, said Don Quixote, and if I make no complaint of the pain it is because knights errant are not permitted to complain of any wound, even though their bowels be coming out through it. If so, said Sancho, I have nothing to say, but God knows I would rather your worship complain when anything ailed you. For my part, I confess I must complain however small the ache may be, unless this rule about not complaining extends to the squires of knights errant also. Don Quixote could not help laughing at his squire's simplicity, and he assured him he might complain whenever and however he chose, just as he liked, for, so far, he had never read of anything to the contrary in the order of knighthood. Sancho bade him remember it was dinner time, to which his master answered that he wanted nothing himself just then, but that he might eat when he had a mind. 
With this permission Sancho settled himself as comfortably as he could on his beast, and taking out of the alforges what he had stowed away in them, he jogged along behind his master munching deliberately, and from time to time taking a pull at the boda with a relish that the thirstiest tapster in Malaga might have envied. And while he went on in this way, gulping down draft after draft, he never gave a thought to any of the promises his master had made him, nor did he rate it as hardship but rather as recreation going in quest of adventures, however dangerous they might be. Finally they passed the night among some trees, from one of which Don Quixote plucked a dry branch to serve him after a fashion as a lance, and fixed on it the head he had removed from the broken one. All that night Don Quixote lay awake thinking of his lady Dulcinea, in order to conform to what he had read in his books, how many a night in the forests and deserts knights used to lie sleepless supported by the memory of their mistresses. Not so did Sancho Panza spend it, for having his stomach full of something stronger than chicory water he made but one sleep of it, and, if his master had not called him, neither the rays of the sun beating on his face nor all the cheery notes of the birds welcoming the approach of day would have had power to waken him. On getting up he tried the boda and found it somewhat less full than the night before, which grieved his heart because they did not seem to be on the way to remedy the deficiency readily. Don Quixote did not care to break his fast, for, as has been already said, he confined himself to savoury recollections for nourishment. They returned to the road they had set out with, leading to Puerto Lapis, and at three in the afternoon they came in sight of it. Here, Brother Sancho Panza, said Don Quixote when he saw it, we may plunge our hands up to the elbows in what they call adventures, but observe, even shouldst thou see me in the greatest danger in the world, thou must not put a hand to thy sword in my defence, unless indeed thou perceivest that those who assail me are rabble or base folk, for in that case thou mayest very properly aid me, but if they be knights it is on no account permitted or allowed thee by the laws of knighthood to help me until thou hast been dubbed a knight. Most certainly, senor, replied Sancho, your worship shall be fully obeyed in this matter, all the more as of myself I am peaceful and no friend to mixing in strife and quarrels, it is true that as regards the defence of my own person I shall not give much heed to those laws, for laws human and divine allow each one to defend himself against any assailant whatever. That I grant, said Don Quixote, but in this matter of aiding me against knights thou must put a restraint upon thy natural impetuosity. I will do so, I promise you, answered Sancho, and will keep this precept as carefully as Sunday. While they were thus talking there appeared on the road two friars of the order of St. Benedict, mounted on two dromedaries, for not less tall were the two mules they rode on. They wore travelling spectacles and carried sunshades, and behind them came a coach attended by four or five persons on horseback and two muleteers on foot. In the coach there was, as afterwards appeared, a Biscay lady on her way to Seville, where her husband was about to take passage for the Indies with an appointment of high honour. The friars, though going the same road, were not in her company, but the moment Don Quixote perceived them he said to his squire, Either I am mistaken, or this is going to be the most famous adventure that has ever been seen, for those black bodies we see there must be, and doubtless are, magicians who are carrying off some stolen princess in that coach, and with all my might I must undo this wrong. This will be worse than the windmills, said Sancho. Look, senor, those are friars of St. Benedict, and the coach plainly belongs to some travellers, I tell you to mind well what you are about and don't let the devil mislead you. I have told thee already, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, that on the subject of adventures thou knowest little. What I say is the truth, as thou shalt see presently. So saying, he advanced and posted himself in the middle of the road along which the friars were coming, and as soon as he thought they had come near enough to hear what he said, he cried aloud, Devilish and unnatural beings, release instantly the high-born princesses whom you are carrying off by force in this coach, else prepare to meet a speedy death as the just punishment of your evil deeds. The friars drew rein and stood wondering at the appearance of Don Quixote as well as at his words, to which they replied, Senor Caballero, we are not devilish or unnatural, but two brothers of St. Benedict following our road, nor do we know whether or not there are any captive princesses coming in this coach. No soft words with me, for I know you, lying rabble, said Don Quixote, and without waiting for a reply he spurred Rocinante and with leveled lance charged the first friar with such fury and determination, that, if the friar had not flung himself off the mule, he would have brought him to the ground against his will, and sore wounded, if not killed outright. The second brother, seeing how his comrade was treated, drove his heels into his castle of a mule and made off across the country faster than the wind. Sancho Panza, when he saw the friar on the ground, dismounting briskly from his ass, rushed towards him and began to strip off his gown. At that instant the friar's muleteers came up and asked what he was stripping him for. Sancho answered them that this fell to him lawfully as spoil of the battle which his lord Don Quixote had won. The muleteers, 
who had no idea of a joke and did not understand all this about battles and spoils, seeing that Don Quixote was some distance off talking to the travellers in the coach, fell upon Sancho, knocked him down, and leaving hardly a hair in his beard, belaboured him with kicks and left him stretched breathless and senseless on the ground, and without any more delay helped the friar to mount, who, trembling, terrified, and pale, as soon as he found himself in the saddle, spurred after his companion, who was standing at a distance looking on, watching the result of the onslaught, then, not caring to wait for the end of the affair just begun, they pursued their journey making more crosses than if they had the devil after them. Don Quixote was, as has been said, speaking to the lady in the coach, your beauty, lady mine, said he, may now dispose of your person as may be most in accordance with your pleasure, for the pride of your ravishers lies prostrate on the ground through this strong arm of mine, and lest you should be pining to know the name of your deliverer, know that I am called Don Quixote of La Mancha, knight errant and adventurer, and captive to the peerless and beautiful Lady Dulcinea del Toboso, and in return for the service you have received of me I ask no more than that you should return to El Toboso, and on my behalf present yourself before that lady and tell her what I have done to set you free. One of the squires in attendance upon the coach, a Biscayne, was listening to all Don Quixote was saying, and perceiving that he would not allow the coach to go on, but was saying it must return at once to El Toboso, he made at him, and seizing his lance addressed him in bad Castilian and worse Biscayne after his fashion, Be gone, caballero, and I'll go with thee, by the God that made me, unless thou quittest coach, slayest thee as art here a Biscayne. Don Quixote understood him quite well, and answered him very quietly, If thou wert a knight, as thou art none, I should have already chastised thy folly and rashness, miserable creature. To which the Biscayne returned, and no gentleman. I swear to God thou liest as I am Christian, if thou droppest lance and drawest sword, soon shalt thou see thou art carrying water to the cat, Biscayne on land, Hidalgo at sea, Hidalgo at the devil, and look, if thou sayest otherwise thou liest. You will see presently, said Agrahes, replied Don Quixote, and throwing his lance on the ground he drew his sword, braced his buckler on his arm, and attacked the Biscayne, then upon taking his life. The Biscayne, when he saw him coming on, though he wished to dismount from his mule, in which, being one of those sorry ones let out for hire, he had no confidence, had no choice but to draw his sword. It was lucky for him, however, that he was near the coach, from which he was able to snatch a cushion that served him for a shield, and they went at one another as if they had been two mortal enemies. The other strove to make peace between them, but could not, for the Biscayne declared in his disjointed phrase that if they did not let him finish his battle he would kill his mistress and everyone that strove to prevent him. The lady in the coach, amazed and terrified at what she saw, ordered the coachman to draw aside a little, and set herself to watch this severe struggle, in the course of which the Biscayne smote Don Quixote a mighty stroke on the shoulder over the top of his buckler, which, given to one without armour, would have cleft him to the waist. Don Quixote, feeling the weight of this prodigious blow, cried aloud, saying, O lady of my soul, Dulcinea, flower of beauty, come to the aid of this your knight, who, in fulfilling his obligations to your beauty, finds himself in this extreme peril. To say this, to lift his sword, to shelter himself well behind his buckler, and to assail the Biscayne was the work of an instant, determined as he was to venture all upon a single blow. The Biscayne, seeing him come on in this way, was convinced of his courage by his spirited bearing, and resolved to follow his example, so he waited for him keeping well under cover of his cushion, being unable to execute any sort of manoeuvre with his mule, which, dead tired and never meant for this kind of game, could not stir a step. On, then, as aforesaid, came Don Quixote against the wary Biscayne, with uplifted sword and a firm intention of splitting him in half, while on his side the Biscayne waited for him sword in hand, and under the protection of his cushion, and all present stood trembling, waiting in suspense the result of blows such as threatened to fall, and the lady in the coach and the rest of her following were making a thousand bows and offerings to all the images and shrines of Spain, that God might deliver her squire and all of them from this great peril in which they found themselves but it spoils all, that at this point in crisis the author of the history leaves this battle impending, giving his excuse that he could find nothing more written about these achievements of Don Quixote than what has been already set forth. It is true the second author of this work was unwilling to believe that a history so curious could have been allowed to fall under the sentence of oblivion, or that the wits of La Mancha could have been so undiscerning as not to preserve in their archives or registry some documents referring to this famous knight, and this being his persuasion, he did not despair of finding the conclusion of this pleasant history, which, heaven favouring him, he did find in a way that shall be related in the second part. Chapter 9 In which is concluded and finished the terrific battle between the gallant Biscayne and the valiant Manchegan. 
In the first part of this history we left the valiant Biscayne and the renowned Don Quixote with drawn swords uplifted, ready to deliver two such furious slashing blows that if they had fallen full and fair they would at least have split and cleft them asunder from top to toe and laid them open like a pomegranate. And at this so critical point the delightful history came to a stop and stood cut short without any intimation from the author where what was missing was to be found. This distressed me greatly, because the pleasure derived from having read such a small portion turned to vexation at the thought of the poor chance that presented itself of finding the large part that, so it seemed to me, was missing of such an interesting tale. It appeared to me to be a thing impossible and contrary to all precedent that so good a knight should have been without some sage to undertake the task of writing his marvellous achievements, a thing that was never wanting to any of those knights errant who, they say, went after adventures, for every one of them had one or two sages as if made on purpose, who not only recorded their deeds but described their most trifling thoughts and follies, however secret they might be, and such a good knight could not have been so unfortunate as not to have what Platire and others like him had in abundance. And so I could not bring myself to believe that such a gallant tale had been left maimed and mutilated, and I laid the blame on time, the devourer and destroyer of all things, that had either concealed or consumed it. On the other hand, it struck me that, Inasmuch as among his books there had been found such modern ones as the Enlightenment of Jealousy and the Nymphs and Shepherds of Inaris, his story must likewise be modern, and that though it might not be written, it might exist in the memory of the people of his village and of those in the neighborhood. This reflection kept me perplexed and longing to know really and truly the whole life and wondrous deeds of our famous Spaniard, Don Quixote of La Mancha, light and mirror of Manchegan chivalry and the first that in our age and in these so evil days devoted himself to the labour and exercise of the arms of knight-errantry, righting wrongs, succouring widows, and protecting damsels of that sort that used to ride about, whip in hand, on their palfreys, with all their virginity about them, from mountain to mountain and valley to valley, for, if it were not for some ruffian, or boar with a hood and hatchet, or monstrous giant, that forced them, there were in days of your damsels that at the end of eighty years, in all which time they had never slept a day under a roof, went to their graves as much maids as the mothers that bore them. I say, then, that in these and other respects our gallant Don Quixote is worthy of everlasting and notable praise, nor should it be withheld even from me for the labour and pain spent in searching for the conclusion of this delightful history, though I know well that if heaven, chance and good fortune had not helped me, the world would have remained deprived of an entertainment and pleasure that for a couple of hours or so may well occupy him who shall read it attentively. The discovery of it occurred in this way. One day, as I was in the Alcana of Toledo, a boy came up to sell some pamphlets and old papers to a silk mercer, and, as I am fond of reading even the very scraps of paper in the streets, led by this natural bent of mine I took up one of the pamphlets the boy had for sale, and saw that it was in characters which I recognized as Arabic, and as I was unable to read them though I could recognize them, I looked about to see if there were any Spanish-speaking Morisco at hand to read them for me, nor was there any great difficulty in finding such an interpreter for even had I sought one for an older and better language I should have found him. In short, chance provided me with one, who when I told him what I wanted and put the book into his hands, opened it in the middle and after reading a little in it began to laugh. I asked him what he was laughing at, and he replied that it was at something the book had written in the margin by way of a note. I bade him tell it to me, and he still laughing said, in the margin, as I told you, this is written, this Dulcinea del Toboso so often mentioned in this history, had, they say, the best hand of any woman in all La Mancha for salting pigs. When I heard Dulcinea del Toboso named, I was struck with surprise and amazement, for it occurred to me at once that these pamphlets contained the history of Don Quixote. With this idea I pressed him to read the beginning, and in doing so, turning the Arabic offhand into Castilian, he told me it meant, History of Don Quixote of La Mancha, written by Sidamete Benengeli, an Arab historian. It required great caution to hide the joy I felt when the title of the book reached my ears, and snatching it from the silk mercer, I bought all the papers and pamphlets from the boy for half a reel, and if he had had his wits about him and had known how eager I was for them, he might have safely calculated on making more than six reals by the bargain. I withdrew at once with the morisco into the cloister of the cathedral, and begged him to turn all these pamphlets that related to Don Quixote into the Castilian tongue, without omitting or adding anything to them, offering him whatever payment he pleased. He was satisfied with two arabas of raisins and two bushels of wheat, and promised to translate them faithfully and with all dispatch, but to make the matter easier, and not to let such a precious find out of my hands, I took him to my house, where in little more than a month and a half he translated the whole just as it is set down here. In the first pamphlet the battle between Don Quixote and the Biscayne was drawn to the very life, they planted in the same attitude as the history describes, their swords raised, and the one protected by his buckler, the other by his cushion 
and the Biscayne's mule so true to nature that it could be seen to be a hired one a bowshot off. The Biscayne had an inscription under his feet which said, Don Sancho de Espacia, which no doubt must have been his name, and at the feet of Rocinante was another that said, Don Quixote. Rocinante was marvelously portrayed, so long and thin, so lank and lean, with so much backbone and so far gone in consumption, that he showed plainly with what judgment and propriety the name of Rocinante had been bestowed upon him. Near him was Sancho Panza holding the halter of his ass, at whose feet was another label that said, Sancho Zancas, and according to the picture, he must have had a big belly, a short body, and long shanks, for which reason, no doubt, the names of Panza and Zancas were given him, for by these two surnames the history several times calls him. Some other trifling particulars might be mentioned, but they are all of slight importance and have nothing to do with the true relation of the history, and no history can be bad so long as it is true. If against the present one any objection be raised on the score of its truth, it can only be that its author was an Arab, as lying is a very common propensity with those of that nation, though, as they are such enemies of ours, it is conceivable that there were omissions rather than additions made in the course of it. And this is my own opinion, for, where he could and should give freedom to his pen in praise of so worthy a knight, he seems to me deliberately to pass it over in silence, which is ill done and worse contrived, for it is the business and duty of historians to be exact, truthful, and wholly free from passion, and neither interest nor fear, hatred nor love, should make them swerve from the path of truth, whose mother is history, rival of time, storehouse of deeds, witness for the past, example and counsel for the present, and warning for the future. In this I know will be found all that can be desired in the pleasantest, and if it be wanting in any good quality, I maintain it is the fault of its hound of an author and not the fault of the subject. To be brief, its second part, according to the translation, began in this way. With trenchant swords upraised and poised on high, it seemed as though the two valiant and wrathful combatants stood threatening heaven, and earth, and hell, with such resolution and determination did they bear themselves. The fiery Biscayne was the first to strike a blow, which was delivered with such force and fury that had not the sword turned in its course, that single stroke would have sufficed to put an end to the bitter struggle and to all the adventures of our knight, but that good fortune which reserved him for greater things, turned aside the sword of his adversary, so that although it smote him upon the left shoulder, it did him no more harm than to strip all that side of its armour, carrying away a great part of his helmet with half of his ear, all which with fearful ruin fell to the ground, leaving him in a sorry plight. Good God! Who is there that could properly describe the rage that filled the heart of our man Chegan when he saw himself dealt with in this fashion? All that can be said is, it was such that he again raised himself in his stirrups, and, grasping his sword more firmly with both hands, he came down on the Biscayne with such fury, smiting him full over the cushion and over the head, that, even so good a shield proving useless, as if a mountain had fallen on him, he began to bleed from nose, mouth, and ears, reeling as if about to fall backwards from his mule, as no doubt he would have done had he not flung his arms about its neck. At the same time, however, he slipped his feet out of the stirrups and then unclasped his arms, and the mule, taking fright at the terrible blow, made off across the plain, and with a few plunges flung its master to the ground. Don Quixote stood looking on very calmly, and, when he saw him fall, leapt from his horse and with great briskness ran to him, and, presenting the point of his sword to his eyes, bade him surrender, or he would cut his head off. The Biscayne was so bewildered that he was unable to answer a word, and it would have gone hard with him, so blind was Don Quixote, had not the ladies in the coach, who had hitherto been watching the combat in great terror, hastened to where he stood and implored him with earnest entreaties to grant them the great grace and favour of sparing their squire's life, to which Don Quixote replied with much gravity and dignity, in truth, fair ladies, I am well content to do what ye ask of me, but it must be on one condition and understanding, which is that this knight promise me to go to the village of El Toboso, and on my behalf present himself before the peerless lady Dulcinea, that she deal with him as shall be most pleasing to her. The terrified and disconsolate ladies, without discussing Don Quixote's demand or asking who Dulcinea might be, promised that their squire should do all that had been commanded. Then, on the faith of that promise, said Don Quixote, I shall do him no further harm, though he well deserves it of me. Chapter 10 Of the pleasant discourse that passed between Don Quixote and his squire Sancho Panza. Now by this time Sancho had risen, rather the worse for the handling of the friar's muleteers, and stood watching the battle of his master, Don Quixote, and praying to God in his heart that it might be his will to grant him the victory, and that he might thereby win some island to make him governor of, as he had promised. Seeing, therefore, that the struggle was now over, and that his master was returning to Mount Rocinante, he approached to hold the stirrup for him, and, before he could mount, he went on his knees before him, and taking his hand, kissed it saying, 
may it please your worship, Señor Don Quixote, to give me the government of that island which has been won in this hard fight, for be it ever so big I feel myself in sufficient force to be able to govern it as much and as well as anyone in the world who has ever governed islands. To which Don Quixote replied, Thou must take notice, Brother Sancho, that this adventure and those like it are not adventures of islands, but of crossroads, in which nothing is got except a broken head or an ear the less, have patience, for adventures will present themselves from which I may make you, not only a governor, but something more. Sancho gave him many thanks, and again kissing his hand and the skirt of his hauberk, helped him to mount Rocinante, and mounting his ass himself, proceeded to follow his master, who at a brisk pace, without taking leave, or saying anything further to the ladies belonging to the coach, turned into a wood that was hard by. Sancho followed him at his ass's best trot, but Rocinante stepped out so that, seeing himself left behind, he was forced to call to his master to wait for him. Don Quixote did so, reigning in Rocinante until his weary squire came up, who on reaching him said, It seems to me, senor, it would be prudent in us to go and take refuge in some church, for, seeing how Malti with whom you fought has been left, it will be no wonder if they give information of the affair to the Holy Brotherhood and arrest us, and, faith, if they do, before we come out of jail we shall have to sweat for it. Peace, said Don Quixote, where hast thou ever seen or heard that a knight errant has been arraigned before a court of justice, however many homicides he may have committed? I know nothing about omissiles, answered Sancho, nor in my life have had anything to do with one, I only know that the Holy Brotherhood looks after those who fight in the fields, and in that other matter I do not meddle. Then thou needst have no uneasiness, my friend, said Don Quixote, for I will deliver thee out of the hands of the Chaldeans, much more out of those of the Brotherhood. But tell me, as thou livest, hast thou seen a more valiant knight than I in all the known world, hast thou read in history of any who has or had higher mettle in attack, more spirit in maintaining it, more dexterity in wounding or skill in overthrowing? The truth is, answered Sancho, that I have never read any history, for I can neither read nor write, but what I will venture to bet is that a more daring master than your worship I have never served in all the days of my life, and God grant that this daring be not paid for where I have said, what I beg of your worship is to dress your wound, for a great deal of blood flows from that ear, and I have here some lint and a little white ointment in the alforges. All that might be well dispensed with, said Don Quixote, if I had remembered to make a vial of the balsam of Firabras, for time and medicine are saved by one single drop. What vial and what balsam is that? said Sancho Panza. It is a balsam, answered Don Quixote, the receipt of which I have in my memory, with which one need have no fear of death, or dread dying of any wound, and so when I make it and give it to thee thou hast nothing to do when in some battle thou seest thee have cut me in half through the middle of the body, as is wont to happen frequently, but neatly and with great nicety, ere the blood congeal, to place that portion of the body which shall have fallen to the ground upon the other half which remains in the saddle, taking care to fit it on evenly and exactly. Then thou shalt give me to drink but two drops of the balsam I have mentioned, and thou shalt see me become sounder than an apple. If that be so, said Ponsa, I renounce henceforth the government of the promised island, and desire nothing more in payment of my many and faithful services than that your worship give me the receipt of this supreme liquor, for I am persuaded it will be worth more than two reals an ounce anywhere, and I want no more to pass the rest of my life in ease and honour, but it remains to be told if it costs much to make it. With less than three reals, six quarts of it may be made, said Don Quixote. Sinner that I am, said Sancho, then why does your worship put off making it and teaching it to me? Peace, friend, answered Don Quixote, greater secrets I mean to teach thee and greater favours to bestow upon thee, and for the present let us see to the dressing, for my ear pains me more than I could wish. Sancho took out some lint and ointment from the alforges, but when Don Quixote came to see his helmet shattered, he was like to lose his senses, and clapping his hand upon his sword and raising his eyes to heaven, he said, I swear by the Creator of all things and the four Gospels in their fullest extent, to do as the great Marquis of Mantua did when he swore to avenge the death of his nephew Baldwin, and that was not to eat bread from a tablecloth, nor embrace his wife, and other points which, though I cannot now call them to mind, I hear grant is expressed, until I take complete vengeance upon him who has committed such an offence against me. Hearing this, Sancho said to him, Your worship should bear in mind, Señor Don Quixote, that if the knight has done what was commanded him in going to present himself before my lady Dulcinea del Toboso, he will have done all that he was bound to do, and does not deserve further punishment unless he commits some new offence. Thou hast said well and hit the point, answered Don Quixote, and so I recall the oath in so far as relates to taking fresh vengeance on him, but I make and confirm it anew to lead the life I have said until such time as I take by force from some knight another helmet such as this and as good. And think not, Sancho, that I am raising smoke with straw in doing so, 
for I have one to imitate in the matter, since the very same thing to a hair happened in the case of Mambrino's helmet, which cost Sacriponte so dear. Senor, replied Sancho, let your worship send all such oaths to the devil, for they are very pernicious to salvation and prejudicial to the conscience, just tell me now, if for several days to come we fall in with no man armed with a helmet, what are we to do? Is the oath to be observed in spite of all the inconvenience and discomfort it will be to sleep in your clothes, and not to sleep in a house, and a thousand other mortifications contained in the oath of that old fool the Marquis of Mantua, which your worship is now wanting to revive? Let your worship observe that there are no men in armour travelling on any of these roads, nothing but carriers and carters, who not only do not wear helmets, but perhaps never heard tell of them all their lives. Thou art wrong there, said Don Quixote, for we shall not have been above two hours among these crossroads before we see more men in armour than came to Albrica to win the fair Angelica. Enough, said Sancho, so be it then, and God grant us success, and at the time for winning that island which is costing me so dear may soon come, and then let me die. I have already told thee, Sancho, said Don Quixote, not to give thyself any uneasiness on that score, for if an island should fail, there is the kingdom of Denmark, or of Sobradiza, which will fit thee as a ring fits the finger, and all the more that, being on terra firma, thou wilt all the better enjoy thyself. But let us leave that to its own time, see if thou hast anything for us to eat in those alforges, because we must presently go in quest of some castle where we may lodge tonight and make the balsam I told thee of, for I swear to thee by God, this ear is giving me great pain. I have here an onion and a little cheese and a few scraps of bread, said Sancho, but they are not victuals fit for a valiant knight like your worship. How little thou knowest about it, answered Don Quixote, I would have thee to know, Sancho, that it is the glory of knights errant to go without eating for a month, and even when they do eat, that it should be of what comes first to hand, and this would have been clear to thee hadst thou read as many histories as I have, for, though they are very many, among them all I have found no mention made of knights errant eating, unless by accident or at some sumptuous banquets prepared for them, and the rest of the time they passed in dalliance. And though it is plain they could not do without eating and performing all the other natural functions, because, in fact, they were men like ourselves, it is plain too that, wandering as they did the most part of their lives through woods and wilds and without a cook, their most usual fare would be rustic viands such as those thou now offer me, so that, friend Sancho, let not that distress thee which pleases me, and do not seek to make a new world or pervert knight errantry. Pardon me, your worship, said Sancho, for, as I cannot read or write, as I said just now, I neither know nor comprehend the rules of the profession of chivalry. Henceforward I will stock the alforges with every kind of dry fruit for your worship, as you are a knight, and for myself, as I am not one, I will furnish them with poultry and other things more substantial. I do not say, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, that it is imperative on knights errant not to eat anything else but the fruits thou speakest of only that their more usual diet must be those, and certain herbs they found in the fields which they knew and I know too. A good thing it is, answered Sancho, to know those herbs, for to my thinking it will be needful some day to put that knowledge into practice. And here taking out what he said he had brought, the pair made their repast peaceably and sociably. But anxious to find quarters for the night, they with all dispatch made an end of their poor dry fare, mounted at once, and made haste to reach some habitation before night set in, but daylight and the hope of succeeding in their object failed them close by the huts of some goatherds, so they determined to pass the night there, and it was as much to Sancho's discontent not to have reached a house, as it was to his master's satisfaction to sleep under the open heaven, for he fancied that each time this happened to him he performed an act of ownership that helped to prove his chivalry. <laughs>